In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our beloved fathers, deacons, nuns, and faithfuls, both in this holy church and those who are watching us through live streaming, may the Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one in nature and one in essence, bless you, guide you, protect you, and deliver you from the snares of the enemy, whether it be visible or invisible. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. The gospel of today. It is from the gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 21, verses 23 to 46, which is the end of the chapter. So it is Matthew 21, verses 23 to 46, the end of chapter 21. The Lord Jesus enters the temple and then the chief priests and the elders of the people approached the Lord and said to him, by what authority are you doing this? Who gave you this authority? Now to understand what the chief priests and the elders of people, uh, to understand what they were saying to the Lord Jesus, we need to go back all the way to the beginning of chapter 21 where the Lord demands from two of his disciples to go to that opposite village of to them where he was staying at the time that place was called Beth Page. Now Beth Page is a Hebrew Aramaic word meaning the house of figs. And that was the place where the Lord Jesus asked two of his disciples to bring that donkey and that colt that were tied together, bring him to him because he was just about to enter Jerusalem on what we celebrate in the church calendar as the Feast of Palm Sunday. And when he came to enter Jerusalem, that was Sunday. And as he entered Jerusalem sitting on the back of that mule, he went and entered the temple and he overthrew the tables of those who were buying and selling and those who were selling doves and said to them, my house, Jesus Christ, my house is called the house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. That was Sunday. After cleansing the temple from the buying and selling, he leaves Jerusalem and remains in a town called Bethania or Bethany. In English, it is pronounced Bethany, but in the original pronunciation, in the Hebrew Aramaic pronunciation, Beth Anya. Beth means house, Anya means agony. And this town, Beth Anya, the house of agony, was the town of Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead after four days, and his sisters, Mary and Martha. They had a house in Bethania, the house of agony, or Bethany. The following day, he goes out and comes back to Jerusalem. On the way, he sees a fig tree. He comes looking, searching for fruits, and they, it was fruitless. And the Lord opens his holy mouth and says to that tree, there shall not be seen fruits in it forever. It withered on the spot. The disciples were blown away by this miracle. They were shocked. They said, wow, look at our master. One word, the, the, the tree withered immediately. The Lord said to them, this surprised you and overwhelmed you? If you pray with faith, you can tell this mountain to be uplifted and be cast into the deep, into the ocean, it shall happen. And the mountain here represents Satan. If you pray with faith, you can 
command Satan to be uprooted and be gone and it shall be given unto you now the following day Monday he enters the temple again the Lord enters the temple again which is the gospel of today when he entered the temple again the chief priests and the elders of the people approached the Lord and said yesterday by whose authority did you do that who gave you the authority to overthrow the tables and kick people out and say my house is the house of prayer and you've turned it into a den of thieves we know and believe this temple is the temple of God are you God to claim it to be yours who gave you this authority so the Lord answers them so simplistically but so profoundly as always is God you cannot argue with God and you cannot with your own intellectual capacity try to corner God this is the dilemma of the human race when someone any human being and every human being when any one of us when any human does not have the love of God in their heart no matter what you do for them they will never appreciate it never no matter what you do for them even if you give them your life they will always try to find something to go against you and blame you for it amazing why because there is no true love of God embedded in them rooted deeply in their hearts it's absent so the Lord asked them this question he said if you can answer this question I will tell you by whose authority I did what I did yesterday on Sunday he said to them the baptism of John the Baptist where was it from was it from heaven or from men now the Lord corners them <laughs> they're in trouble so they went in that little corner over there and they started talking to each other what shall we answer now it is kind of difficult situation this man is too smart for us if we say it is from heaven i.e. God then he will say to us why didn't you believe in the baptism of John the Baptist and why didn't you receive baptism at his hand and if we say it is from men people hold him so highly as the prophet of God if we say his baptism is from men they will stone us to death the followers of John the Baptist will stone us to death so the best answer we will say to him we don't know <laughs> so they came thinking they're smart we don't know he said all right the Lord said since you don't know I'm not obligated to tell you where my authority is from I won't tell you either next time before you talk before you ask before you approach you better check your heart and see what kind of a condition it is approaching God are you coming to question his wisdom are you coming to put him to the test are you testing God what kind of an approach it is all dependent on your approach the the reply from God will be you approach him with false glory as if you are something special he will put you to shame you approach him by putting him on the spot and testing him he will put you to shame you approach him with humility he will glorify you 
he will exalt you. He'll say, you're my son. Yet I am full of sins from head to toe, but he will come and say, this is my son. Because you humbled yourself before the Lord. But you see, humility is not, a, it's not that easy. It takes wisdom. Now the problem with the human race, they're trying to figure out God by going to universities and studying and becoming something special. Oh, I'm a professor in physics. I'm a professor in whatever. I, I have PhD in this. Listen, all this gave you knowledge, not wisdom. Get it? You will never be able to humble yourself before the Almighty God until you receive wisdom. Guess what? Notre Dame, Oxford Universities does not give you wisdom, gives you knowledge. The only one who gives wisdom is God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All glory to His holy and mighty name. God is the only one. Now, to receive wisdom, you need to be humble. And to be humble, you need to know Him. And when you get to know Him, you need to love Him. Because when you know Him, you love Him. When you love Him, you'll know how He operates. You will humble yourself before Him. You see, first get to know Him in order to love Him. Because when you love Him, you'll get to know Him. The first time you met a girl, Habibi, mm, I was out with me mates, mate. And then my eyes fell on this good looking Sheila. I saw a gazelle running right before me. I said, oh, she broke my heart. So you went and approached that gazelle. You don't know her. She doesn't know you. So you introduced yourself. You got to know the person. When you came to know the person, that was the only time you were able to begin loving the person. Because what leads to love is knowledge. You've heard this so many times. But when you came to love the person, the love revealed more knowledge of the person. And the more you came to know him through that love, the more you began to know how to function and behave around the person. Hello, hello. If you, as a man, don't wash the dishes tonight, you are in deep trouble, brother. So you better humble yourself and go into that kitchen and start washing the dishes because the president, being the wife, ordered you to do so. And if you don't wash the dishes, you will sleep outside in the gutter. So you need to know God in order to love Him in order to know him and then realize one thing about God, he will never give you his wisdom unless you humble yourself before him. Wisdom, it takes wisdom to manage life. It takes knowledge to manage a small aspect of life. Yes. This man is a professor at Sydney University and he is a very successful professor at Sydney University. But he is a miserable failure as a husband and a father at home. Why? Because it takes wisdom to manage home. But it takes knowledge to manage Sydney University. Anyone home? So your PhD as a church leader Gets you nowhere, my dear friend. If you think you can manage the church of the Lord and the flock of the Lord through your PhD, Satan is laughing at you. Satan is laughing at you. It takes humility to manage the, the Lord's flock, not knowledge, wisdom. Humility is wisdom. That's why there are so many church leaders who are very well educated, but miserably failures as church leaders. They lack wisdom. They have a lot of knowledge, but not much wisdom. They don't know Jesus because it takes wisdom to live with the Lord. It takes knowledge to talk 
about the Lord. It's so easy to talk about the Lord, but so difficult to live with the Lord. Because to live with Him means you need to deny yourself, give up on everything you love and do everything He loves. Now this, not everyone is able to do so. Why? Because they lack humility. So those chief priests, the educated leaders, what has changed? Nothing. Whatever happened in the Old Testament exactly identically happened in the New Testament in relation to Christ. Church leaders are challenging the Lord again. They're saying, we hold the key. You don't even hold a can of sardine, my dear friend. What key? If you held the key of the Lord Jesus, why would the church be in turmoil? Why would the church be so weak? It couldn't even stand before Corona. What happens when Lexus comes? Ah. We couldn't even handle Corona. Then you have Toyota Camry, and top of the range Lexus Habib Albi, you know, more classy. What are you gonna do when Lexus come after you? Bad boys, bad boys. <laughs> it takes wisdom. Wisdom, my beloveds, wisdom. to humble yourself before the Lord. Now these chief priests, the educated, the PhD holders of their time came to corner the source of wisdom. The Lord put them to shame with one little question. The baptism of John the Baptist, where is it from? He's talking to them like talking to kids at a kindergarten level. Yet they thought they are masters. Tell me, little boys, John the Baptist, where was his baptism from, heaven or earth? They couldn't even answer this question. Mm. That was Middle Eastern style. Mm -hmm. The Lord was literally saying to them, if you had believed in John the Baptist, you would have believed in me. You know why? Because John the Baptist is my ambassador. And when the king of a country sends his representative to another country, his representative, the ambassador, will speak, will do things according to the king's dictation. The ambassador does not speak of his own does not do things out of his own mind. Everything he says, everything he does, he does it according to the king's directive. So that's why when John the Baptist came, baptizing people at the River Jordan, what did John the Baptist say to the people? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When the Lord Jesus came, what did the Lord Jesus say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Wow, where did John the Baptist get this message from? His king, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's why he said, if you had believed in John the Baptist, you would have believed in me and where I got my authority from. I got it from myself because I am God revealed in the flesh. That's why I said to this temple being my house, not God's, mine, because I am God. This temple is mine. But you've turned it into a den of thieves. My house is called the house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. We've told you this before. Den of thieves has seven entries to it 
seven openings, seven gates. The den of thief is the skull, the head of the human. The Lord is referring to your head and my head. Two eyes, two ears, two, the opening of the nost two nostrils and the mouth. Two, two, two and one, seven. He said, the reason why you've turned my house, which is supposed to be the house of prayer into a den of thieves, because your eyes saw things God forbade. Your ears heard things God did not want you to hear. Your nose smelled things God said do not smell. And your mouth said words against God. This is why you allowed Satan to enter because a den is where lions live. Lions, vicious, furious lions. And what does the Holy Bible say about Satan? A roaring lion awaiting any one of us to be swallowed. Is that roaring lion? So we allowed Satan to enter our head and distorting the truth. That's why instead of being the house of the Lord as the house of prayer became a den of thieves. In the church, Christians went against one another and devoured one another. Wow. The Lord then says, this man had two sons. He came to the first one and said, go and work in my vineyard. He said, I'm not going. Isn't that the typical answer to mom and dad? <laughs> Children, <laughs> daughter, we're going to church. Mom, get a life. Son, come with me. Nah. Why? Because. The magical word because that is my definition of I don't want to talk to you short and sweet because so I said son go and work he said no and then after a little while that son he felt bad he said you know what that's not right to break my dad's word he went eventually and worked in the vineyard. And then the father went to the other son, second one, and he said, go and work in my vineyard. He said, yes, sir. He was a good boy, but he never went. What a good boy. He played it very smart, didn't he? Of course, dad. And then behind dad's back, get alive, dad. You think I'm gonna go? I'm stupid to go, get alive. Then the Lord asked him, he said, which of the two sons did the will of his dad? They said, the first one. He said, let me tell you this, you high priests, you chief priests and the elders of the people, tax collectors and harlots will have gone into the kingdom of God before you. You think you are the people of God? Tax collectors whom you despise, harlots whom you reject completely and you don't even greet them lest, lest you be defiled by them. He said, they have gone into the kingdom of God before you. My advice to all of us, don't ever my son, don't ever my daughter think that you are someone more special than the other. Don't ever do that. Don't say, I have faith more than everyone else. I love the Lord more than everyone else. Be careful. If you start talking this way, Satan will come and make you fall. Simon said it at the Last Supper. If all of these, he didn't even say my brothers. <laughs> all of these, who are these Simon? They're your brothers. You've been living together for three years following Jesus Christ for three years and six, four months. You call him these? Ach, ouch. 
if all of these deny you, I will not deny you. Simon, you will deny me before a woman, not even a man or a Roman soldier. This woman will come and say, looks like you are one of the followers of Jesus Christ. He swore, he made an oath. I don't know this man. And in Matthew 16, 18, he said to him, you are Jesus Christ, son of the living God. He acknowledged his divinity and humanity. Simon acknowledged the divinity and humanity of the Lord and before a woman, he swore, I do not know this man. Oh. Why? Because he put himself before the Lord. If all these deny you, I will not deny you. I first, then you, Jesus. The Lord did not give him the keys. When did he give him the keys? After resurrection, Simon, come here. Do you love me? He said, I've learned my lesson, Lord. You know that I love you. Ah, good boy. Now that you've put your Lord before you, and then you, now I'll give you the keys. I can trust you with the keys, Simon. That's the, the spoiled name of Simon. I call him Simon. I love him, huh? he's a beautiful saint, a mighty one. Don't ever put yourself before anyone, let alone God. When it comes to sin, Put yourself number one. When it comes to sin, put yourself as number one. I am the only sinner. Everyone is a saint. And when it comes to love, put yourself the last one. Because if you put yourself number one in love, you'll expect everyone to do things for you. But if you put yourself last, you will do everything for everyone except you. So my daughter, if you're married, don't wait for your husband to come and say sorry. You go and say sorry. Embarrass him with love, baby. Now, until he comes and apologizes, he will never hear me. He will never see me. I will never talk to him. I'll cook nothing for him. He can go and buy frozen food. And you pick yourself and sleep in that on the other side of the house. Understand, don't ever come near me again. No, he made a mistake. It's okay. He's a man. That's all he knows. Men, men are simple. They're not sophisticated like you are. They're not as smart as you are. So men are very simple. Monotone. You are stereo. You've got too many wires coming through your head. He's got only one wire. Sometimes it blocks. Speaking of men, What is the difference between the man's brain and the woman's brain? This is all within our topic. The man's brain is made out of a lot of boxes. So is the woman's brain made out of a lot of boxes with a difference. The boxes in the man's brain are not connected to one another. The boxes on the other hand in the woman's brain, they are all interlocking, interwoven, interconnected. So one box is, <laughs> uh, and there's another difference. There is one box in the man's brain that is non-existent in the woman's brain. This box in the man's brain is called empty, nothing. 
Have you seen your husband all of a sudden switched off and gone, became very quiet? Now he's using the empty box. And you being a perfectionist in perfect timing, you will come and nag, 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 nag when he is using the empty box. Shame on you. What are you doing? Playing PlayStation and I'm cooking and I'm cleaning and I'm washing. And he looks and he doesn't say a word. It makes you even more angry. Because that's his empty box. <laughs> there is nothing in it. <laughs> that's why he'll give you nothing. <laughs> he'll just look and turn around. So if he gets on your nerves, the best thing is for you, my darling, to go and say, honey, you've been spending too much time in that empty box of yours. Can I just let tell you one thing? I miss you, darling. I love you and I need you. Can you please come out of your empty box? He will jump out of that empty box and he will be the Mr. Super Duper for you and he'll come flying faster than... Uh, what's that guy that flies? Superman. Superman. It's always beautiful when you say sorry. When you say hello, it's always beautiful when you humble yourself. Don't wait for the other. You do it. You start it. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. Mine, yours, it doesn't matter. Just like that Indian guy went into this place to buy a drink. So the, the person there said, um, $4. He gave her three. She said, sir, the drink cost four dollars, you gave me three. Don't worry, keep it for you. <laughs> she said, no sir, you owe me a dollar. He said to her, doesn't matter, I owe you, you owe you, no problem. Keep it please, keep it for you. Doesn't matter, I owe you, you owe me, doesn't matter. The dollar, keep it please. So we need to be humble in order to live in love to live in love. When we lack humility, life becomes extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. Because no matter what you do, you can never please that person who lacks humility. Very difficult to please. That's why the Lord Jesus, the first thing ever he will demand, demand of us is humility. The first thing. When we come to him the first time ever, he said you need to carry the cross. What is the cross? Humility. Humility, what is humility? Cross is death. What is death? I don't exist anymore. Why? Because now the one I love is my existence. I no longer live for me. I live for the one I love. That's humility. And we see that in marriage. Will you take her in good time, bad time, sickness and health? He said, yes. What a liar, man. And she said, yes, 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 yes. All she is thinking about Honeymoon in Hawaii. After honeymoon, get a life. We need to live for the other, not for me. The Lord was questioned in a nasty way because those chief priests and the elders lacked humility. This is the problem of the church till this very day and it is the problem of the entire human race why are we fighting there is no humility why are we spying on one another because there is no humility you know God gave so much resources in this world that can feed not only 8 billion it can feed 80 times 8 billion and it will never cease 
Don't ever believe in what they say in these mainstream medias. It's all lies. These are the sons of the snake feeding you lies in order to distort the truth. God put enough resources to last you till the day he calls it the day. You can have not only one child, you can have as a family 20, 30 children and there will be plenty food for every single one because God is the Almighty capable of doing anything and everything. With God, nothing runs out. His treasure house is always overflowing. But why are we fighting? Everybody's trying to run to be the superpower. To achieve what? Foolishness, blindness, ignorance. Absolute ignorance. But that's the world. But the church is not supposed to be like the world. Even in the, even in the church, we are running to try and be the ultimate, the best of the best. My throne is greater than yours. My position is higher than yours. My church is bigger than yours. My followers are more than yours. What is this? What is this? I don't want to keep you too long even though I always love to keep you as much as I can. The Lord said there was this man who was a landowner. He had a vineyard. He surrounded that vineyard with fence. And the New King James hedge, call it a fence. I like hedging. <laughs> with a fence. And then in that vineyard, he put a wine press. He built a wine press. And then he had a big tower built in that vineyard. And then he leased it to the vine dressers. After a little while, he sent his servants seeking fruits from the vineyard. Those vine dressers who leased that land from the owner, when they saw those servants of the owner, some of them they beat, they stoned, and some killed. The owner said, okay, I'll send again. And he sent more the next time. They did the same thing as they did to the first lot. Then the owner said, I will send them my own son. Lest they be ashamed or embarrassed of my son. When they saw the son, those vine dresses, they said, oh, he is the heir to everything. Let us kill him and let the inheritance be ours. So they took the son outside the vineyard and they killed him. The Lord said to these chief priests and the elders, he said, what will this vine vineyard's owner do to such vine dresses? They said, he will punish them severely and he will give the vineyard to others where they give him fruits in its season. He said, haven't you read the very stone, the chief stone, the very stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. Haven't you read the very stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. That's why this vineyard will be taken away from you you chief priests and elders, and it will be given to a nation where they will give me the fruits in its season. They understood he was meaning them. They tried to stone him, but they were afraid people will go against them. This land owner is the Lord Jesus. Vineyard is his church. The fence around it is the law of Christ for his church. He gave law to his church, commandments to his church. This is the fence. As long as you abide by my word, church, the fence is strong. Enemy cannot enter or infiltrate. But the moment you start breaking my word 
and go against my word, my beloved church, the fence will collapse, the enemy will come and trample you underfoot. Satan will infiltrate the church. And Satan has infiltrated the church far from all of you. That's why the church is in division, is in turmoil. And when the church is divided, it is weak. This is why the church gave in to Corona. But the problem is the church. This land owner had a vineyard, church, the owner is Christ, the church is that vineyard. He put a fence around it, his law. The Holy Bible is his law. He said that to the church, abide by my word. Let my word be your strength. And then he put a wine press in that vineyard. Wine press is the holy altar, his body and blood. The strength of the church is the body and the blood. Satan, please open your ears. Believe me, Satan now is eating hot Indian pepper because I'm talking this way about him. He's on fire. I can see him. He wants to come and, and shut, shred me. Uh, be gone. Okay. I have my Jesus. So get lost, Satan. He, Satan, will do anything and everything for you to let go of the body and the blood of Christ. He will let you sing for him until kingdom comes. He will let you preach for him until kingdom comes. He will let you come to church until kingdom comes, as long as you don't receive the body and the blood. Because the only thing that burnt him, that crushed his head, was the body and the blood. The only thing. You take the body and the blood out of the church, kiss that church goodbye. Satan is playing soccer in that church. Believe you me, believe I don't care how many times you shout. Without the body and the blood, you are dead, dead. It is not my word, it is the Lord's. He who takes my body and drinks of my blood lives in me forever. But he who does not receive my body and blood, he has no life in him, no life. No life. He'll give you anything, everything, as long as he takes you away from the body and the blood. The church has gone to sleep for quite some time. Needs to wake up. And I'm talking about the apostolic church, either Catholic or Orthodox. Need to wake up. You need to speak about the Lord with fire. Holy Spirit, you need to engulf the whole world for the Lord Jesus. You have the sacraments, you have the Holy Spirit working. Why are you gone to sleep? Because the apostolic church seeked thrones, not Christ. Thrones, not Christ. Lemazines, not walking barefooted. We lived in high places. We did not humble ourselves. Why should I as a bishop sit in a limo? Why should I as a bishop walk on red carpets? Why should I as a bishop have bodyguards? Why should I as a bishop live in a mansion and have millions upon millions upon millions? For what? For what? For what? For what? There are millions of people dying, starving in the street. If anything, I need to take my clothes off and put it on that naked person. If I truly seek the Lord Jesus. When Great Britain was in India, enslaving the Indians. 
Gandhi, who was a Hindu, a Hindu, a non-believer in Jesus Christ, a Hindu. When he came and saw the icon of the Lord Jesus nailed on the cross, the crucified Jesus. When he looked at the Lord on the cross, he said this beautiful statement. He said, give me the Christ and take away the Christians. I don't want the Christians, I want the Christ. Because the Christians, Great Britain is known to be Christian to the world. He said, the Christians have enslaved me. Jesus wouldn't have done this. Jesus came to set me free. Yet you call yourself Christians, walking in the footprints of Christ, yet look at you enslaving people. Get away, you Christians, I want the Christ. The Christ loves me, you don't. We need the church to go back to her glorious days, Ephesus. And the word Ephesus derives from the Greek word meaning the beloved. To the rebellious church. But Ephesus was beloved, why? Because Simon Peter, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, James, John, all of them were humble. None of them had mansions, none of them had limousines, none of them, none of them were dressed up in linen and gold and walking in cathedrals built out of marbles, stone, precious stones, silver, gold, and, and diamonds. None of them. They walked barefooted in the streets. And if you looked at Simon Peter, you would have mistaken him by a street beggar. He was this kind of a look on him, a street beggar. But this street beggar raised the dead and changed the world. Where are those leaders? Today, if there is a little spot here on, the, on my outfit, oh, oh, I want it clean. It's too dirty, I can't wear it. I get a life, get a shovel and go and dig, man. You know, if I'm given a chance, I'll make them all work for the doll. <laughs> Go and clean the streets of Fairfield. Bishops, cardinals, yalla, let's go. Get the broom and get the shovel and let's go and clean the streets. But before you clean the streets, let's go and clean people for Christ. The church needs to be strong. And he put a tower in that vineyard. The tower is God himself, the Lord Jesus. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The tower is God. You know why? Because when you go up there, you can see the enemy coming from a long, far away. The tower is to watch for the enemy movement. And the tower is God when you are instilled, embedded in God, you will see the movement of the enemy. You will know who is right and who is wrong, where the light is and where darkness is. Because when you are in Christ, Christ will reveal to you everything, everything. We need to come to the Lord with humility. There is one God that has created everything visible and invisible, the physical and the spiritual realms. This is the truth. Forget about Bing Bang and gorillas. You didn't come from an ape. Stop this nonsense. Darwin's theory, evolution, he can stick it on his forehead and on that round table where he was a member of these evildoers. And I'll leave Great Britain to elaborate on what the round table was all about. Because it's their invention. There was members on the, in that round table, all of them atheists to the core, hating the Lord Jesus. Not anyone else. Not Islam, not Buddhism, no, no, no. no. They were deliberate against the Lord. Why? Because Satan, only hates the Lord Jesus. 
He doesn't give one penny about the others. Because there is only one who crushed his head. And that's why he's furious. He's fuming. I can't believe I was defeated by this man called Jesus. That's why he can't stand Jesus. And he will fight against everyone who proclaims Jesus as their Lord and Savior. All the round table members, atheists to the core, hating the Lord. One of their agenda was to reduce the world's population. This, uh, what's his name? Bill Gates, ah, oh, Bill Gates, yeah. Bill Gates is just part of it. It's nothing. It's just a little toy. When he expires, he's just gonna disappear. He disappeared already, I don't know. Do you hear of him? Nothing. Bill Gates coming in the 21st century, we need to, who do you think you are? This was already discussed in the round table centuries before you, yeah? Reduce world population. Ash on your head. God, is the only one until he speaks nothing happens I pray not for anything huh? I don't care they come kill me they do whatever please do me a favor I don't, I don't want this world I, just, I can't wait to leave I can't wait to be with my Lord you can kill the body you can't kill the spirit you little kids right so you'll do me a favor but I pray the Lord Jesus on this Holy Sunday to plug Satan from his roots and all his foul spirits and every evil doer, every human being that is following Satan, worshiping Satan and doing Satan's work, I pray the Lord decimate them all and teach them a lesson that there is only one God who art in heaven and his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. How dare you try to be God, you little piece of dust. May every evil agenda be put to shame. May every evil agenda be put to shame. May every evil agenda be put to shame. And may every church leader, their heads to be bowed before the feet of Jesus Christ of Nazareth for his head needs to be seen and none of us, none of us, none of us because there is only one head to the church and that head definitely is not the Pope, not the Patriarch, it is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get it through your thick heads. Enough. Shame on us Christians. We can't even unite the calendar for Sunday resurrection. When are we going to unite with our canonical laws and theological indifferences? When? Shame on us. This landowner had a vineyard. The church is the Lord's. It's not the Pope. It's the Lord's. Can't even unite the Sunday resurrection. They tried to change the Sunday to be neither Orthodox date nor Catholic, as if it's theirs. Do you think the Catholic rose from the dead or the Orthodox? Seriously. Is the sepulchre church the Catholics or the Orthodox? It's the Lord's, you fools. It's the Lord's. You ignorant. The holy fire is the Lord's. It's not orthodox. It's the Lord's. The tomb is the Lord's. It's, that's why it's empty. Our one is full of termites and rotted bones. It's the Lord's that is empty because He is the only one as a human being that is sinless, perfect as God. It's the Lord's, enough. You wanna unite? Come where the holy fire appears and unite that date. That is the Lord. The holy fire has been coming out of that tomb for the last 2,023 years. And 
in few more weeks it will come again in 2024 without fail it's the Lord who cares about Catholic Orthodox who cares it's the Lord unite for the sake of the Lord why you are we are not because we lack humility and we lack true love that's why humility and love are missing I'm not angry <laughs> I'm just shouting for the Lord if there is anyone who is a sinner is me believe you me believe you me I'm shouting to receive the mercy of the Lord because without him I'm dead without him I'm lost without him I'm blind without him I'm weak without him I'm nothing I'm shouting for the Lord to have mercy on me because I need him he is my life my everything my everything my everything young men and young women mothers fathers husbands wives grandparents grandfather and grandmother without the Lord all of us are nothing we need the Lord we need the Lord we need the Lord amen the skinny guy said to the fat guy What's going down, brother? The fat guy replied and said everything. <laughs> That's why I'm fat. And I just, I've run out of jokes. I'll, um, this is a repeated one about a hundred million times. I'll say it again. <laughs> this husband, <laughs> now wives, please be careful, huh? Please pay attention. This husband, used, he named his wife, my life. That was her name. My life, good morning. My life, how are you? My life, let's go. My life, come. My life, my life, my life, my life, my life. One night they were asleep. The husband wakes up startled. He sensed there was something in the room. And as he, woke, as he wakes up startled, he sees the angel of God standing before him. He said, Kriya Leison. Lord have mercy angel what is it he said I came to take your life he said here she is <laughs> you see after all men are not that dumb they can get you back when it really counts take her baby she is my life <laughs> oh my goodness I'm crying. <laughs> Love the Lord. Amen. Let's bow our heads. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our good God and full of mercy, our good God and full of mercy, whose grace and mercy is poured upon all. Pour, my Lord, the compassion of the delightfulness of your love upon your servants, and again transform them in the hope of renewal to the life of repentance. Renew in them your Holy Spirit, by whom they are sealed for the day of salvation. Purify them by your compassion from all flesh and spiritual blemishes, and assure the hope of their faith by the aid of your grace, and instill the walks of their behavior in the paths of righteousness. Please them along with the saints in your kingdom by the assurance of the hope of their faith in the adoption as your children and in the joy of your absolving mysteries. Empower them by the aid of your mercies to observe your commandments and fulfill your will, to confess, worship, and praise your holy name, the Lord of all, Father and Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Amen.